A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4, verses 18 through 25. Listen for the Word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fisherfolk. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. At once, they abandoned their nets and followed him. As Jesus went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. At once, they abandoned the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the reign of God curing every disease and every malady among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases, tormented by pain, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics. And he cured them, and great crowds followed him from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. For the word of God in its promise and covenant. Thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you call us to follow you, then nothing else matters. And if you do not call us to follow you, then nothing else matters matters. Grant us faith to rouse belief so that we may follow you with reckless abandon. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who heals. Amen. So Jesus is ready to get this party started. He's anxious for the very best, most beautiful gospel good news to be proclaimed. For everyone with ears to hear, eyes to see, or spirits to discern, Jesus is announcing an ominous message. Repent, do a 180-degree turn, for the future God wants and ultimately will have has come near. However, there's a question brewing in our minds already. What kind of invitation is that announcement exactly? Are we expected to bring gifts? To whom do we RSVP and how? And finally, what are we turning away from and what or whom are we turning toward? To this point, Jesus has not done much publicly. No healings, no teachings, And yet, Jesus has already realized he cannot do this work by himself. Maybe Jesus knows his limits and that he can only do so much. Son of God, though he may be, Jesus is still son of woman, human. So let's think about it. What happens if Jesus burns out? What if Jesus gets killed? Who will carry on the message and continue the work? If Jesus is the only one at God's party, if he's the only one that can hear the beat of the music and dance to the slick rhythms of God's grace, well, then what fun would that be? The more people, the bigger the crowd, the more recklessly inclusive the invitation, the more followers he has, the grander the party will be. So Jesus needs followers, disciples of Christ. People who will listen to the music of the spheres and abandon almost everything to follow him and do what he does. Announce that the future God wants and ultimately will have is here and now, even as it is still on its way. For those yearning for a better way of life, I'm sure Jesus' announcement seemed liberating. Whereas for those who profited over things never changing, the status quo remaining in place, 
Jesus and the party to which he was inviting everyone seemed threatening. And of course, there are those who are neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm and would rather ride the fence for as long as possible, mending their old worn out nets, lest they take the risk, choose a side, which could offend someone. God's good future is just getting started through Jesus, whom we would call the life of the party. And of course, you and I know the rest of the story. We know what's going to happen. But if we want to hear this gospel for the scandal that it is, if we want to see Jesus, if we want to discern the movement of God that is taking shape through Jesus, then we must abandon almost everything. Everything we think we know. And after we've abandoned that, we will be found by the one who calls us by name and invites us to follow and join in the party that is breaking through the world. When preparing for the worship, uh, when preparing the worship guide today, I googled different art for the cover and found Calling Disciples by the Chinese artist He Qi. I may have squealed with delight in my office because this painting perfectly captures this text. Jesus calls brothers Simon Peter and Andrew and then calls brothers from another mother, James and John, who were sons of Zebedee. Matthew must think Zebedee is important for he's referred to three times. James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and Jesus called them. At once they abandoned the boat and left their father and followed Jesus. So take a look at this artwork. Zebedee is still in the boat, net in hand. What do you think is on his mind? Is Zebedee waving to his sons as if to say, good luck, sons, go with God. I wish y'all the best. Or... Is the father saying, you have two seconds to get back in this boat and help me mend these nets, or you can kiss your supper goodbye? In my sanctified imagination, I hear Zebedee calling out to his son saying, honor your parents so that your days may be long in the land the Lord is giving you. Exodus twenty twelve. After all, producing children was, among other things, an insurance policy, a retirement plan for parents in their old age. Yet these two new disciples recklessly abandon their nets, their boat, their profession, and their father in an act that challenges sacrosanct family values. And what of the son in the artwork who is waving back to his father in the boat? How do we interpret his gesture? Yes, the call of Jesus is a certain um, lure, pun intended. And yet our familiar patterns, customs, parents, and families of origin still have their hooks deeply set. I don't know that we can ever completely, totally, recklessly abandon these holds. Matthew tells us that Jesus called them, and we interpret that as Jesus having called the brothers. However, it is just as possible that Jesus called all three of them, brothers James and John, and Father Zebedee. The sons respond in favor. The father, however, remains in the boat. Maybe you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Or as Jesus would later say in this gospel, you cannot pour new wine into old wineskins. For Zebedee, I wonder if it was more comfortable 
to go with the ways he knew, sit in a boat and weave, weave together a dilapidated net for the hundredth time, then abandon almost everything, take a chance on newness, hear new music, and join in a party that's just gathering steam. We get Zebedee's dilemma, don't we? We are creatures of habit, and by God, we love us some sameness. Old hymns, familiar interpretations of sacred stories that leave our unquestioned beliefs intact. Structures, denominations, personnel, budgets, outreach, institutions. Now, if you think for one second that I am triangulating with the Holy Spirit to harp on you, church, let me say that I have my sacred cows too, and don't you dare touch them. Don't come for them. But here's an example. I love the alternative. And yet when I think about changing it or doing something different with it, My blood pressure rises, my pulse accelerates, and then finally my conscience interrogates me and says, well then, Nathan, why did you call it the alternative if you are inflexible? The shoe fits. So hear me say, this tension that we feel is not an old versus young dichotomy. Even the Reverend Dr. Katie Hayes, lead evangelist for Galileo Church, says that her congregation, which is still in its infancy in ecclesial years, loves its routines. Come in and suggest change, she says, and we may not hurt you, but we may look at you in such a way that you might think we would hurt you. (laughs) Recklessly abandoning what we know to pursue a promise that's not yet realized or for a party that's not yet in full swing is oh so difficult. For those first five people who were called, Jesus asked them to give up or abandon their way of life. But that's not without risk. Jesus' call of the disciples occurs amid the empire, the Roman Empire's close control of fishing, whereby licensing, quotas, and taxation secure Rome's sovereignty over the water and its contents. Their identity as fisherfolk meant they were involved and participatory in the imperial, economic, and political monopoly. Fish were claimed as revenue for the empire. Every rare and beautiful thing in the wide ocean belongs to the imperial treasury, says ancient Roman rule. They worked for the man upstairs, and I know I know it's hard to imagine any other system existing still in 2023 in which the lowest wage people elevate the profits of those who are on top. Fishers were not high on the Roman pecking order. In fact, people who made their living fishing were as socially despised as predatory lenders, and greedy thieves, and oh my God, how they smelled. These fishers have a socially inferior and economically precarious existence under Roman rule. So imagine the cost of Jesus' call. They have to abandon what little they have to behold something they can never own or claim as their individual own? Or is it that the future God wants and ultimately will have 
is first made manifest among the last, lost, and least. Jesus' call upsets the dominating imperial reality by asserting God's sovereignty and offering an alternative way of life. But to participate in this alternative means that people who have sensed Jesus calling their name must recklessly abandon the way things have been, the way things still are. However, by abandoning everything, they know what they're turning away from and what and whom they are turning toward. They'll understand what it means to be found by the one who has called them by name, invited them to follow, and join in the party that is just breaking throughout the world. When I was the assistant director of choirs for Canyon High School, a student and his family moved to the small panhandle town from inner city Dallas. Kane O'Laughlin was a junior, and he had the persona of a gangster. He wore the biggest, baggiest, solid color t-shirts and jeans, and frequently wore a matching baseball cap that was always cocked off to the side. As a new teacher, Kane intimidated the heck out of me. His involvement in the choir, though, was his salvation, or maybe mine, maybe all of ours. He grew into the group, and we changed and transformed right alongside him. One year, our choir traveled to New York, and my grandmother went with us. I have a picture in my office of Cain and my grandmother dancing together in the streets of the Big Apple. But one night during Kane's senior year, he was driving home with his younger sister in the car. He ran a stop sign. The collision with the other car was almost immediate, and he and his sister died. One of the ways we coped through the next year was to tell stories. Cain had many anecdotal quips, most of which I cannot repeat from this pulpit, which is, if you know my threshold, saying something. (laughs) However, his favorite phrase was this, sing with reckless abandon. When I left Canyon and started teaching at Tyler Junior College, my mom painted the phrase, sing with reckless abandon, on my office wall, along with Cain's name. Everyone got to hear the story of that quote. According to Cain, we were to sing as if our life depended on it, to sing without being self-conscious, to sing because we're happy, to sing because we're free, to sing with reckless abandon. Cain and his phrase caused me to love the word abandon. It sounds boundless, open, liberating. Throughout seminary, I saw this word amidst the deep dives into Scripture. In the NRSV translation, we read that immediately Peter and John left their nets and followed Jesus. And immediately James and John left the boat and their father and followed him. However, the word in the Greek is abandon, which seems much more sudden and dramatic, as if they threw up their hands and said, we're done with this, we quit. When Jesus teaches the longest lesson ever, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus instructs the disciples on how to pray. 
there's this line, which we've already said this morning. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But the verb in Greek is abandon. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're asking God to abandon our sin from us with the same expediency as the first disciples abandoned their nets. But oh, if it were really that easy to abandon our nets. Old habits die hard, don't they? In fact, in John's gospel, between the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, Peter and Andrew and the sons of Zebedee go fishing again. It's as as if they said, well, we had a good run. Back to the boats and nets. The lure of the familiar never really goes away. It's always there, standing at the stern of the boat, net in hand, waving, calling us to come back to what once was. In telling this story, Matthew says that the first four followers abandoned their nets. But the tense of that verb didn't mean that they abandoned their nets once and for all or once and done. The verb has the same aorist tense that we talked about last week with the word fulfill. The disciples long ago, just like you and I, must keep leaving our nets, the webs that entrap us and hold us captive, if we are to follow Jesus with reckless abandon. But by abandoning everything, We know what we're turning away from and what and whom we are turning toward. We'll understand what it means to be found by this one who has called us by name, invited us to follow, and join in the party that is breaking throughout the world. This is what the party looks like, Matthew says. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the reign of God, curing every disease and dis-ease, every malady among the people. So much so that Jesus' fame spread throughout all Syria, and everyone brought to him people who were sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and disease, tormented by things we can only begin to imagine. But that's what it looks like when the party gets started. And the call of Jesus Christ to join in that party is so persuasive and so compelling that we cannot help but follow with reckless abandon.